Well, good morning. Let's start off with a question. Have you ever had a moment where someone asked you a question, right? And all you could think was this. Have you tried Googling it? Like, have any of you ever had a moment like that? All right. You know, where someone comes up to you and asks you a question, and you just think, why are you asking me this question? You could, you could just Google it. And, you know, Google's great. You know, you can, you can just go on there and ask a question. Boom, there's your answer. You can have Siri ask it for you. Even this uh, sort of guru guy, he, he knew about the power of Google, right? This man here is on some sort of quest to find the meaning of life, and he's in the Himalayan somewhere, and the uh, guru de- guy tells him just to, to Google it. Well, I, I found this, and I thought, well, maybe that's good advice. So I said, you know, what is the meaning of life? Well, maybe Google can tell me. So I Googled it, and here's one of the things I found. Snoopy. You guys like Snoopy? Yeah. All right, Snoopy's great. Snoopy's amazing. And Snoopy, even though, wrestles with the deep questions of life. Where am I going? What am I doing? What is the meaning of life? Bound up in every one of our hearts is this question, how do I experience meaning in life? Right? Everyone, to some level, is on a quest to search for and to find meaning in life. It's bound up in our hearts, and I believe it's because we were created that we were made in the image of God, right? And we are made for meaning. We are designed for purpose, But apart from God and apart from a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, we we can't know or or discover that purpose, but it doesn't stop us from searching. And so people everywhere are searching for purpose, searching for meaning. And I really think, though the question isn't so much what is the meaning of life, but is how do we experience this thing that we long for called meaning? Now, I, I thought about how many people experience, and I just want us to walk through some of the common ways that people look for meaning in life. Number one, people look for it in happiness. Right now, happiness is not a bad thing. Are you with me? How many of you enjoy laughter? All right. Laughing is good. In fact, the Bible says that it's good for you, right? That it's actually like medicine for you. I'm going to move this over because I will probably just like throw it off the stage later. (laughs) And the brave people in the front row would suffer. Happiness is a good thing, right? But if we make the pursuit of our life to find happiness, right, we'll ultimately not find what we're looking for. Some people think it's in comfort. Now, I want you to know I am a fan of comfort. Anybody else here a fan of comfort? Man, I love being comfortable, but will not find the meaning of life in it. How about family? I love my family. I am so, so thankful for my family, for the family I grew up in and for the family that God's given me now. I love my family. I I can't imagine life without them, but meaning in life ultimately can't be found there. How about success? Well, this is an avenue that a lot of people take. And, and there's nothing wrong with being successful. Right? There's nothing wrong with pursuing success. But if we look for and think that we'll find meaning and purpose in success, we'll find it an empty avenue. What about money? I only have to ask if you like money or not, all right? right money is a good thing, right? There's nothing wrong with money. It's, it's a good thing to have. And, you know, right now, I, I'm assuming most of you, you know, live in a place where you don't really need money, right? Because mom and dad give you a place to live. I probably, they, do they put food in the fridge for you? You have no idea how amazing that is, all right? Enjoy this season of life, right? Because there'll come a day when you have to buy your own food and fill your own fridge. Money's great, but if we pursue money as though it will give us meaning in life, we'll find it empty. And we see it all the time, right? You know, I, I I know you are in the bubble right now, but in case you're wondering, Powerball just went over 500 million, all right? And people go crazy, right? They, oh, I got to get a ticket. Even though my chances are like 10 times worse than getting struck by lightning, I, I think I got a chance, right? And, and why? Because bound up in our hearts is the thought that if I had more money, I'd have more meaning. Popularity, all right? I never had to worry about this one, all right? But Sometimes you think, if I'm just famous, if I'm well-known, I'll find meaning. But all of them are empty. One last one, and this one may be the closest one of all that won't give us meaning, but we think might. And that's this. All right. All right. It's close, right? It's close. But it's not there. 
We're in Romans chapter 8, and I want us to look at a few more verses in this great, incredible chapter that Paul gave us in the book of Romans. And we're going to look uh, primarily at verses 10 through, through 14 this morning. And, and from there, we're going to launch out into a few other things that Paul says in some other books as we kind of wrestle with and think about the question, how is it that I experience meaning in life? As we continue to think about the great possible that God has marked over our life, I want us to think of it in terms of what does that have to do with meaning in life? So let's begin in Romans chapter 8, and let's read verse 10 together. Romans chapter 8, verse 10. Paul says, but if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Let's look at verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now, as we've read these verses, you might be thinking, uh, that's great, and maybe you're trying to think, what, what is Paul really trying to get at? What is he meaning here? And we could spend all day wrestling with that. And you might be thinking, what does this have to do with purpose? Or what does this have to do with meaning? And what I want us to, to see and discover, because Paul is going to talk extensively about resurrection in, in these verses and what it means. Right? And we've, already, we've already talked about and discovered that the Bible says the wages of sin is death. right? Separation from God. And so Paul says, if Christ is in you, right, that, that's a, a description of what our state is. If we have come to faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior, right, that Christ through the Holy Spirit is in you and you are in Christ. And so, but if Christ is in you, he says, although the body is dead, what does he mean? Your body, your physical body that you're hanging out in right now, right, is subject to death and to decay. Right, I can tell you, uh, as now I've been described by one of the middle school students in my church as a middle-aged man, all right? It was, it was brutal, all right? We were sitting in the mall. I was hanging out with our youth group, and, 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 and they just casually described me as a middle-aged man. And I thought, I'm not a middle-aged man. Then I went and looked in the mirror later, and I was like, well, they might have something. <laughs> but I can tell you that the body is subject to decay, right? Our teeth decay. Our bodies start to wear out, right? And one day... Apart from the return of Christ, we will all experience physical death, right? It's appointed, the Bible says, unto man a time to die. It's a result. It's a part of the curse of sin. But God gives us great hope because, you see, the shadow of death, it, it, it really casts a shadow. point us to the hope that we have in the face of physical death. He says, although the body is dead because of sin... The Spirit is life because of righteousness. And so you have life that will go on beyond death. That when your body dies, it is in no way the end of you or the end of your existence. In fact, it's really the beginning or even what we might consider the prelude to the beginning. Because look at what he says in verse 11. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. And Paul's talking here about resurrection. See, our great hope isn't just heaven when we die, but it's a resurrected body that will be like Jesus' resurrected body. And in that body, we will experience and live in God's kingdom forever and ever and ever. New heavens and a new earth. And that is our hope. And, and what I want us to begin to see this morning is that understanding the mission of our life, the possible that God's placed over us, must be seen in light of the resurrection. And then we'll see that meaning in life is found in understanding resurrection life. First thing I want you to think about this morning in relates to this is, is that God is giving you resurrection life. If this is a promise that God has given you. This is our great hope that we have in Christ. Resurrection life. And look what he says. He says, if the spirit of raised, him, him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. I just want to think about that. Verse 11. You see, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the central theme of Christianity and really of the scriptures. Right? Jesus' is death and resurrection are essential to our faith. Our faith in Christ, if you know Jesus as your Savior, our Christian faith is built on and hangs on the resurrection. 
Right? It's, it's what makes biblical Christianity distinct from every other religion and philosophy. I mean, there are hundreds and thousands of religions and spiritual philosophies. Right? And in our day and age, it's, it's popular to say that they're all valid, that they're all equal. Right? As long as you're sincere, you have faith, and that's what matters. But if Jesus rose from the dead, then they're not. Because Jesus made a very audacious claim, right? He said, I, I am God, right? He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then he said, I'm the light of the world. And then he told his disciples the night before he died, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. No one gets to God. No one experiences eternal life except through me. Jesus, I am the exclusive pathway to relationship with God. And then he died the next day on a cross. But three days later, he rose from the dead. And Paul, who's writing this letter, had his life radically changed and transformed by an encounter with the resurrected Christ. And, and you know, maybe, maybe, you know, probably most of you, you know, you believe that Jesus rose from the dead. But maybe, maybe a few of you are skeptical. And that's okay. But I, I want you to know there is evidence for our faith. And Paul, in 1 Corinthians, and 1 Corinthians is a pretty neat book because even the most critical scholars, people that do not take God's word for being necessarily inspired or in any way inerrant, and they'll discredit a lot of the books. But 1 Corinthians is a book that even the most critical scholars will say that was definitely written by Paul, definitely written in the first century, definitely written within, say, plus 20, plus 30 years of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Extremely close to the events of that time. And Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 argues very powerfully for the resurrection. And he talks about the, our gospel. And then he says, he says you know, this, this resurrection of Jesus, he says, you know, he appeared. And he appeared to Peter. And he appeared to James, his, his half-brother who was not a believer. He appeared to all 12 disciples. In fact, he appeared to 500 people at one time. And he says, a lot of those people are still alive. So if you don't believe my story, you can check it out with them. And then he says, most of all, you know, he appeared to me. Paul's life was radically changed by an encounter with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection is essential to our faith. It's central to our faith, and it's central to the meaning of life. In fact, the most pivotal question I think that we can ever really ask or answer is, is or did Jesus rise from the dead? Did Jesus rise from the dead? Right? If Jesus rose from the dead, then what he claimed was true. And if Jesus rose from the dead, we can trust what he said. If Jesus rose from the dead, we can stake our destiny to his life. If Jesus rose from the dead, then we too have hope for resurrection. In fact, Paul, you know, as he goes through 1 Corinthians 15, he, just, he talks about the, really the absurdity of life and of faith if we don't know the resurrected Jesus. In fact, he said this um, in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, if the dead are not raised, if there's no resurrection, then he says, our philosophy for life should be, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Right? He says, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then meaning and purpose in life is found in fulfilling yourself. And really, that's what the world will tell you today. That meaning and purpose is bound up in fulfilling your desires, your wishes, your your your. The, the things that you desire in your flesh and your heart and your spirit, fulfill yourself and you'll find meaning. But the resurrection means something completely different. It means there's meaning in a very, very different way. Our whole outlook has changed. And I want us to continue to read in, in Romans 8, verse 12. Paul says this. So then, brothers, we are debtors. Are any of you guys in debt? No, I counseled. I know you're in debt because you're in school. Right? <laughs> Anyone's been in college has been in debt. I, in fact, I paid off my last student loan this year. So pretty... <laughs> but if you're in debt, you have an obligation, right? What is your obligation? You pay it back, right? Someone has lended you money, usually with interest, and you have an obligation to pay it back. And so what Paul's saying here, he says we have an obligation. So then, brothers, we are debtors. We have an obligation. But it's not to live to the flesh. And Paul's using flesh to describe our old life before we knew Christ. 
He says, we don't have an obligation anymore to follow our old ways or our old nature. But instead, we have an obligation to live according uh, to live according to the flesh. Because he says in verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Right? Not, not through work, not through effort, but through a relationship with God by the Spirit of God. He says you will put to death the deeds of the body, and then you will experience life, eternal life, resurrection life. For all those who are led by God's Spirit are God's son, God's children. So, number two, God sets you free to live life shaped by resurrection. You see, our purpose, our possible, is bound up in the resurrection life that God is giving to us. Purpose and meaning are now found in our new life in Christ. And so what I want you to begin and understand, first of all, is your great hope that you have because Jesus rose from the dead. That, that death is not the enemy that it used to be. That death one day will be defeated and swallowed up. But in the meantime, we live in hope and in confidence because Jesus rose and he's promised us his resurrection life. But it also means not just that we have this hope for later, but we have and find purpose and meaning now. That our search, our quest for meaning and purpose is now bound up in this resurrection life that God has given to us through Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. I think Paul puts it really, really clearly there. Talking about Jesus, he said, He died for everyone. So that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves, but instead they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. You see, our meaning, our purpose in life is found and bound up in the resurrection life of Christ. And so Paul puts it very, very clearly. He, says, he, Jesus, died for everyone. right? And so those who receive by faith his new life will no longer live for themselves. You see, the call of the gospel, the call of resurrection life, it is not to seek purpose and meaning for yourself, but it's to seek the glory of the one who died for you and who was raised to life. Our possible, the possible that I believe is marked over every one of your lives, ultimately isn't about you. It isn't about your dreams and your desires. It's about God's dreams and God's desires for you. And they are found not by him trying to keep your life, but by being willing to lose your life. He says those who receive this new life no longer live for themselves, but instead they will live for Christ. Why? Because he died for you. Right? You say, you know, why should I? Man, it's my life. I want to do what I want. I'm going to live for me. I'm, man, I'm young. I'll live for God later. That's not the call of the gospel. It doesn't matter what your age is. It doesn't matter your story, your situation. The call of the gospel is to lay down your life and to live for the glory of the one who died for you. You say, why should I live for God? Because he gave his son up for you. Because he loves you with this unending, incredible, fierce love. And he says, not only did he die for you, but he was raised for us. The resurrection of Jesus unlocks the key question. Of how do I find meaning and purpose in life? And how I find meaning and purpose in life is by receiving and experiencing the resurrection life of Jesus in me through faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then by following Jesus in this new life, by seeking after him, by loving him and living for him and serving him and realizing that life and meaning in life is found not in trying to take for myself, but in being willing to die to myself. Meaning in life is not found in pursuing pleasure or seeking purpose. It's found in knowing and living for and loving the one who loved you and gave himself for you. And so our challenge as we seek purpose is to live as if. To live as if what Jesus has done for us is true. The greatest thing that you can do in life is to live for the glory of God. God has an amazing possible marked over your life. And that possible is not found in trying to keep your life, but in dying to yourself and living for the one who's giving you resurrection life. Meaning in life is found in knowing, loving, and serving Jesus. I want to share very quickly with you the story of a young man named Jim Elliott. 
And, and many of you have heard that name, heard his story. Maybe some of you have. But Jim Elliott was a young man who, who grew up many, many years ago. He was athletic. He had a absolute astute intellect. He was incredibly intelligent. And he went to Wheaton College. And while he was at Wheaton College, God began to stir in his heart a passion and a desire to take the gospel to people who had never heard it. God began to birth in him a, a, a hunger to let Jesus be known among those who had not yet heard his name. And that passion and that desire ultimately led him to the country of Ecuador. And through a series of circumstances to have a burden and a heart for an unreached people group who had never heard the gospel and who were hostile and savage towards outsiders. And he and a team of four other men began to make contact with them. They began to have some positive contact with them. And one day, as they were making contact with them, something went wrong. And all five of those men were killed. They had a weapon with them, but they had chosen ahead of time that they would not defend themselves because they knew Jesus and these folks did. Jim Elliott, years before, had said this. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. You know, the world would look at someone like Jim Elliott and they'd say, you're a fool. Right? He died a young man, his daughter was, was little, never got to watch her grow up, didn't get to tuck her into bed, didn't get to see her graduate high school, didn't get to walk her down the aisle. He didn't get to do any of those things. And the world would say, you were foolish, you were smart and athletic, you could have done anything you wanted, you could have lived your life. But he realized there was something greater to live for, the glory of the one who died for him and who gave him resurrection life. And because he had this view that, 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 that I have purpose and meaning bound up in the resurrection life of Christ, that I have eternal life in him, I can give up my life to serve Christ. He inspired a great movement of missionaries. He, his wife and, and another one of the widows went back to those very people that killed their husbands and they shared Jesus with them. And many of those people came to know faith in Jesus Christ. God used him in a great way. God had an incredible possible marked over his life. But it didn't mean the pursuit of all the things that we might think normally would be fine meaning in life. But I promise you this, there was never a moment of regret the moment he saw a Savior's face. And neither would there be a moment of regret in any one of our hearts if we would be willing to give our whole life to Christ. I had the privilege of knowing one of the founders of this camp, Gladys Jaden. She was still alive last century when I was a camper. And her favorite verse, her life verse, was Galatians 2.20. She would quote it all the time. You can still hear her saying, she said this, I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Just, just... Dwell on that line. It says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. Life isn't about you. It's about Jesus and his life lived in you. God has an amazing possible marked over your life. I don't know what his plans and dreams are for you, but I know they're far greater than you could ever imagine. And God calls you to surrender your life to his purposes. It's my heart and my desire that every one of you would say, God, here's my life. Whatever you want to do, however you want to use my life to bring you glory, I want to live for the one who died and was raised for me. Resurrection is the key to the meaning of life. And once we realize that my life is bound up in the resurrection life of Christ, once I realize I have that, then I can say that Jim Elliot, he is no fool who gives that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Would you bow your heads in prayer this morning? Father, I pray for, for every one of our students this morning, for our faculty, for our counselors, for myself. And Father, I pray that, that in a fresh way this morning, that you would grip our hearts with your greatness and your glory and your splendor, but also with the depth of your love towards us. And that you were willing to give your son 
as a sacrifice, as an offering for our sin. That, that Jesus was willing to go to the cross and experience judgment and wrath. He was willing to be forsaken, Father, so that, that we might experience rescue and redemption, that we might know your resurrection life, and that we might know purpose and meaning, that for which we were created. And Father, I pray that every one of us would realize the hope that we have because of the resurrection. And Father, I pray that in light of that, we would seek to find meaning and purpose, not in living for ourselves, but in dying to ourselves and living for you. And God, I pray that you would take our lives and use them in a great way to advance your kingdom and your name. We ask this in Jesus' name.